in the name I am that I am, Sanat Kumara. We raise the sword of living flame of the Divine Mother unto the starry abode of the Buddhas. Let the soul rise upon the coil of being. Let the light of far off worlds descend. Let this sword raised on high pierce then the sky veil and penetrate beyond the domain of all outer consciousness. Let the Buddhas out of Nirvana, who have come to reinforce universal cosmic Christ consciousness, establish the strength of the cord of love with our hearts. Let all challenges to the path of compassionate love within our hearts be bound in this hour. O Eros and Amora, Buddha of the Ruby Ray, Chamuel and Charity, Legions of Light, Maha Chohan, Paul the Venetian, hear our call in this hour. Let the full power of the divine love within our hearts Banish now all challengers who would stand as a dweller on the threshold, on the four lines of the cosmic clock, where we raise up the living sword of the ruby ray. And therefore let the power of God love, God obedience, God gratitude, God vision, reinforce by Elohim, by five Dhyani Buddhas, Lord Gautama Maitreya Sanat Kumara, the power of the Godhead of Christ and solar awareness to defeat every foe of mild dislike, hate and hate creation. We call for the invincible majesty of the God flame and the sword of the great Kali in this hour let the legions of the ruby ray defend our god obedience and bind the assailants all assailants of disobedience stubbornness and defiance of the law of almighty god within and without this temple of immortal being which i am that i am within and without this community of the buddha of the divine guru and the chila. Goddess of liberty, stand with us in this hour. We invoke the lords of karma for the binding of all assailants within and without who bear the vibration of ingratitude before the great God gratitude of the mighty fleur de lis, threefold flame of my heart, which I am that I am. Expand, thou mighty threefold flame. Come forth, O mighty Bodhisattva Kuan Yin. Open the gates to the Buddha, the Lord of the world, to Amitabha, to the five Dhyani Buddhas. Open the gates, Kuan Yin and Mother Mary. O thou divine mother, Alpha and Omega, we summon legions of light in this hour to repel, to repel and drive back, to drive back and repel. Therefore, all assailants on the 10 o'clock line, let this door to the sanctuary of our being be guarded by legions of great silent watchers, Cyclopea, Virginia, Therefore, for the binding of all sensuality, selfishness and self-love, narcissism, suicide and death and hell that would enter there, let the power of the ruby ray go forth. Let it go forth, O God, for the binding of that which has prevented the expansion of the mighty threefold flame in our hearts. 
seven holy Kumaras and solar Logoi. We, the keepers of the flame, stand in the earth in this hour, keeping the flame of life, of divine love, of fearless compassion before all the hordes of darkness who would take from us the tenderest love and the tenderest flower of our love in the very heart of Gautama Buddha, Padma Sambhava Maitreya. O light of the morning star, Sana Kumara and Lady Venus, let thy love ray flush out now all conditions of death and hell that oppose the manifestation of the ruby cross in America and planet Earth. Let every heart of light receive the initiations of the Holy Spirit. We stand guard in this hour by the mighty sword of the Divine Mother in defense of the light bearers in this the hour of Maitreya's initiation. Let them pass their tests, O God, by thy living flame of love. To that end, we keep the flame in this hour. In the presence of Kuan Yin and all Christed ones, Bodhisattvas and Buddhas, that the earth might prevail for the light bearers who are the capstone in the pyramid are present to keep that light, to keep that sacred fire on the mountain, to keep that flame. In the holy name of God, before the goddess of liberty, we stand. So help us, our God. So help us in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Divine Mother, Amen. Beloved Cyclopeia gave us the most important message that we could hear in this lifetime. In fact, in all lifetimes. He told us that we could not go beyond our present level except by the doorway of divine love. The divine love in this hour is the absolute prerequisite to moving forward on the path of the bodhisattva and to entering in to the path of physical and spiritual survival. What concerns me about this very statement is that many times the students of the Ascended Masters believe that they are fully endued with divine love because they entertain loving thoughts and feelings toward life and toward one another. The path of divine love is more than this. It is the path whereby we do indeed challenge those very conditions on the four lines of the clock which represent the path of the ruby ray. As you know, the 12639 is the blue flame cross, the cross of the power of God and his will. And the 17410 is the pink and the 28511 is the yellow. We see the conditions of consciousness that are listed on the cosmic clock on those lines. We list them off, we know what they are, and perhaps we are working on them or we believe we are mostly free of them. Mild dislike includes, of course, irritability, annoyance, anger, hate and hate creation is the full venting of that dweller on the threshold. Being out of harmony with Almighty God and all of his emissaries, being out of step with St. Germain and the hierarchs of Aquarius who are on that line. What we must realize is that there may be a surface expression of these conditions, and these may be transmuted as we consciously work to avoid offering ourselves as an instrument of that type of behavior in place of love. But in the very core of the psyche and the very core of our psychology, this is where absolute good 
and absolute evil reside. Completely hidden, almost, from all outer circumstances and individuals, rarely showing itself, rarely surfacing. Absolute evil does not surface except in the presence of absolute good as God. In the presence of the initiators of the brotherhood, in the presence of those who bear an extraordinary light of the brotherhood, and those who come with that mantle, whether as the guru or as the chila. Then suddenly you may see what Kathumi describes in his book, The Human Aura, the turning inside out of the individual, and all of a sudden you find an absolute hatred, not a relative hatred. You find an absolute anger, not a relative one. And it comes out and it is expressed as the anger of the dweller on the threshold against the light bearer, against the absolute God good of that light in the world. The warring in our members, therefore, represents our own Armageddon that goes on deep within at subconscious levels. The question that is before every one of us every day when we awaken is are we prepared to put on the whole armor of God and absolute good, which will require us to set aside many conditions of relative good and evil? Are we prepared to stand in that light and therefore to deal with the challenger of that light as that challenge may come through any life stream on the planet or the conglomerate of death and hell of the astral plane? As we enter the path, then, of the Ascended Masters, we first step into the great joy, the rejoicing of the violet flame, and the great good, the great alchemy that comes upon us. We see immediate change. Angels surround us. It is the bliss of being born once again out of the heart of the Divine Mother and knowing what it is like to be wrapped and enveloped in her swaddling garment. The path then of the violet flame and the seven chohans of the rays takes us in the way of self-mastery whereby day by day we recognize that all the good we have externalized in the strengths of our human development, our human ego, our education, our professions, our experience, what we have garnered through many lifetimes, all of this is there. And each day, it becomes enlivened, purified, distilled by the flames of God. And where we had talent as an artist or a musician, we now find that we have a greater talent. All of these things we are shown and we are given so that God can introduce us to that path and its ultimate goal. After months and years on this path, and many times lifetimes, when we have increased, therefore, a certain Christ awareness in our being, and we have truly come close to our Lord, we reach that level on the path of the Apostle, the disciple of Christ, the Bodhisattva of the Buddha, where we take our vows to embody that light, to stand for that light, to be warriors of the spirit in defense of that light. For you see, we have come to the place where the increase of light is so great that we begin to feel the challenges of the dark ones who see that a nova, a new star, is about to rise in the heavens and that newborn child, that one anointed of God, is about to reach the full stature of the incarnation of the word, and it is at that point where that one will be a threat to all fallen angels and all of those who have elected to take the left-handed path where they go through the first period of joy with God and teachings, and then they determine to take that light to reinforce the not-self. They are not prepared to surrender it. We see then that as the light does increase, we must become as the wise ones of old. We must understand that if we are to continue to go up the mountain, there are greater dangers 
than, be, than being in the foothills. Those dangers then come upon us as the force of the anti-word. The false hierarchies and the fallen ones know well the path, and they know the timing of the path, and they know the steps of initiation. And therefore, just as you are about to enter in a more accelerated consciousness of God, they come. They know you must enter the temple and be initiated by one of the twelve hierarchies of the sun. And so they stand on the threshold at the very door as you would come and enter in. And they come with the exact temptation, the exact opposite of that glorious virtue and God quality which you will achieve if you do enter in into the heart of those initiators and tarry in that temple, one of the twelve temples of the solar hierarchies, as we name them on the cosmic clock. The ascended masters who are our sponsors in those temples are listed on the twelve lines of the clock. So to your outer awareness, that dweller on the threshold who lives beneath the very doorstep will emerge finding in your own life stream the weakest link, the record where you did fail and fail again, your tests of initiation, for instance, on the path of God love, the initiation of Aquarius. There are many convergences in this hour to the path of love and its initiation, not the least of which, of course, is the 2,000-year dispensation of Aquarius and the reign of St. Germain and Portia. That line of the clock happens to be the line of the seat of the soul chakra, and therefore it is the soul being initiated in this 2,000-year period. The door then is wide open for the soul, the great pearl that is cast into the sea, into the astral sea, to find herself, to remember that she must answer the call from on high, for the soul to hear that call and then to give the call in response. It is a very precious moment when the soul first hears that call and does respond to the Father, Mother, God and does recognize that she has been sent forth on a mission, on an odyssey, on a path of initiation to descend to the most dense and dark levels of existence to prove her love, that her love will always be greater no matter whom or what she meets, no matter what is offered to her that seems to be greater. She will always remember her first love, the Father, Mother, God, the I Am Presence, and the presence of the twin flame in heaven. So in this age of Aquarius, we once again know that the path of the soul's return is opened to us. It is also the era and the century of the coming of the Holy Spirit who comes to initiate us by the path of love. Thanks to Mother Mary who gave us the teachings on the cosmic clock, we know this path of love cannot be won, cannot be fulfilled if we do not meet the requirements on the 1, 7, and the 4, 10 axes. These God qualities are key. Do we have them in the absolute sense of the word? Absolute God love, absolute God obedience, absolute God gratitude, absolute God vision. The 4, 10 axis involves the third eye. The soul cannot make it on this path without the vision in the third eye. We do not have vision in the third eye if the light of the chakras is descended, descended below the heart into the lower chakras and being misqualified. Therefore, the emphasis on the conserving of the sacred fire and the raising up of that fire by the bija mantras, by the violet flame, by self-discipline, by a path that is total, 
whereby we are increasing our perception of what is self-mastery in the physical octave. What does it really mean to be in control of one's physical body, one's physical brain and mind, one's emotions and desires, one's memory, and all of these as the integrated personality in God. The personality of the good, then, we seek to embody. Our goal is to be the fullness of that word incarnate, to let that God be manifest in us, who is manifest in Jesus Christ, in every ascended master. We come, then, as we stand on that threshold, the very first of the four lines of the ruby cross, God love. And there we will find all of the records of hate and hate creation in our own subconscious. There we know that the tempter who dwells waiting for us outside the gate of this particular house and temple of the Lord's will look on the computer of the fallen ones to see where is our weakest point? Where is it in the seat of the soul chakra? Where is it in the conditions of the physical body which that chakra governs? Where in the history of our soul have we been weak, spineless, without decisiveness, and without charity, and the givingness of self, and a love that overwhelms and overcomes all selfishness and all lesser conditions, lesser considerations which we have of our own self. So there will arise the temptation that we have not passed, the test that we have most often failed. And whether or not we even get into the temple to be received by Saint Germain and Portia, whether or not we are received by the hierarchies of Aquarius will be determined by how we make it, and it is a solo flight. You are alone when you enter that gate. You may be in this very community, but you may be entertaining all manner of thoughts, of doubt, misgivings, compromise, and again, the misuses of the light on that one o'clock line. And so you may take that step to, to take the low road instead of the high road without my outer knowledge or anyone else's. It may never be known, or one day you may realize it and realize the failed test right to me in the form of a report or a confession and allow me to intercede, to give you enlightenment, to decipher and to separate the real from the unreal and once again to appeal to the hierarchs of Aquarius to pass that initiation. Now the consideration we have in this hour is that we see that many students of long standing on the path are coming to that very point of the why, which Maitreya described in his New Year's dictations about three years ago. And those initiations have to do with the choosing to embody the light of absolute good or the darkness of absolute evil. And so we find that there may be in some and that there is in some decisions being made or vibrations being held that, not, uh, that are not of the light but that are of the darkness. But even when they are of the darkness, they are hotly defended with a sense of great self-injustice or injustice toward others. And yet you will look upon such individuals and they have no light emitting from them, no light coming forth from their chakras or from their eyes. And yet they may have been on a path of this teaching or some other teaching that has been sponsored over the centuries by the Brotherhood for many, many years. And the reason that they do not have the light is because in all of those years of decreeing or praying or giving mantras, whether east or west, they have never internalized the light because they have never been willing to challenge the absolute darkness in that core of the psyche, that core of hate and hate creation, which is the absolute hatred of the light and of the living Christ. And therefore, theirs has been a path of overlaying the mantras, overlaying the steps of the teachings as a surface. Maybe it is one inch thick. Maybe it is less, 
Maybe it is a quarter of an inch. But they have carefully avoided the confrontation and the challenge with the core antipathy of the dweller against the living light of God. People will ask me when people fail on the path and leave the activity or leave any organization that is dedicated to God and do so in anger. How can this be? How can this be? How could they have changed overnight? People do not change overnight. You simply have not seen that this is how they have always been. And they have simply dressed themselves, dressed themselves in the rituals and the path and the teachings, but they have not internalized it because they have never been willing to go through the process where one casts oneself upon the rock of Christ and is broken, where one can confess and look at and see that there is this core of hatred of the Father, the Mother, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. One can look at it in all of its terribleness, in all of its ugliness, separate out from it and say, this is not my true self, I will have nothing to do with it, and then give the calls for the binding of that not-self, which you know as the dweller on the threshold. In the course of giving teachings on this subject in the past several months and intensifying these since the dictation of our beloved El Moria, I have recognized, just as I have recognized last evening and given to you conditions we were working on, that certain individuals throughout this movement do not desire to separate out from that dweller on the threshold. They have already chosen the path of embodying it. And I can make calls for these individuals as long as I would be willing to spend my breath. And because it is an interference with their free will, the Brotherhood will not respect that call. And Moria will interrupt me and tell me that it is the work of the individual that I may not do this without their full cooperation. Some of you may have heard the remark that El Moria made, which was, there are those who are succeeding in the binding of this dweller. There are those whose dwellers remain unbound. There are those whose dwellers are at their very throat, at the very juggler to destroy them. There are others who take their dwellers to bed with them and pull their sheets over their head to conceal that dweller. In other words, they are in a very sympathetic vibration to it, and they have made their bed with that dweller, and they wish to hide that dweller even as they would hide from the face of God. These choices must be made, and they must be confronted. And that is why we are here. That is why we take up the study of the path of the Bodhisattva, and that is why we appeal to the heart of Kuan Yin and Mother Mary to enter into the heart of the Buddhas. It is a very serious path, and we come to the nexus, the nexus of the why and the nexus of the figure eight. And this is where we find that many are called, but few are chosen to enter in. Many answer the call, but they bring the bag and baggage of that dweller and they refuse to see how, like a cancer, the dweller on the threshold grows with the mind and in the mind, grows in and through the desire body, the memory body, and finally the physical body. That it is not simply separating out from a separate identity which is already separate, but it becomes so integrated in the very traits that some people carry dishonesty with oneself and all of the various lesser and greater vices that humans are heir to. And therefore, it cannot just be decreed away. We have to work very hard to go after, for instance, an element of dishonesty within oneself or dishonesty toward others or the element of anxiety or the element of Pride. Pride is something that is very much interwoven with one's whole personality. It is not easy to separate out 
and so we carefully watch ourselves as the saints have done, as they have written in their diaries, as they have confessed to their confessors, and we watch whether or not our behavior and our modes are calculated to evoke a response of praise or admiration for others, whether we want people to know uh, about those uh, inner groanings of the soul or our desire to be uh, good in the sight of God. Then there is, of course, ambition itself, where the ambition to success and money is greater than the desire to be the servant of God. There is the condition where people consider themselves to be patrons of God or patronesses, and therefore they are going to sponsor God uh, with some great um, endeavor that they are about to engage upon. And therefore, they will do God favors by sponsoring him, not in the sense of being sponsored by God, but in the sense of doing such good for him that they will therefore receive his praise. And therefore, God will be beholden to them for the success that the path of God may have had on the planet. The motive behind the action needs to be examined. And often because the self does not have objectivity, we do not recognize when our motives are pure and when they are not. And we have to pray to God to show us and illumine us. And God will, whether through ourselves or someone else, or something we read or something we see, we will, we will come to an awareness or we will see someone else of a similar astrology to ourselves or similar traits and we will have to wrestle with that condition and that person and we will look upon them and we will say and admit to ourselves is this not the very same thing that El Moria has wrestled with in me all of these years and now he is showing it to me objectively as I must deal with it in another and of course that happens a great deal in partnerships marriage or business or in the classroom employer employee and so forth so God has many ways of revealing himself to us, even if it is Kuthumi opening his garment and showing us in the mirror the worst enemy of self. I have taken heart to read the letters that have been written to me and very specific ones that have discussed the seeing of their own dweller and their challenging that dweller having seen it. I would like to say then that most often when I am to deliver a lecture on any subject, as in this one today, I could feel myself embroiled and embattled and surrounded by every challenger to these four lines of the clock, the one, four, seven, ten. Those lines, those lines in your electronic belt, those lines in the community. And I could feel those forces pressing in and I could feel the vibrations of death and hell, of the misqualifications of those lines of the clock. And as I was preparing to come, I could sense and know what a tremendous burden is upon this planet and upon any light bearer who would try to get beyond a certain level of path and faith. One can be quite contented being a devout Catholic, uh, a, devote fo a devoted follower of Krishna, or of any of the teachers that are around in the world today. There is a certain area of comfortability. One can live in an ashram, one can be a vegetarian, one can practice yoga daily, one can have a life of quietude and peace, and everyone can have a, a sense of reverence and holiness because there is not an acceleration to that place where all that they have garnered must now be engaged in the very battle for the life of the soul against the enemy that is within. And when we beat the enemy that is within, we can take on the enemy that is without, both in the communities, in the nations, and the planet, and on the scale of solar systems and galaxies, where evil is rampant throughout the physical universes. To take on the challenge of aliens in their spacecraft, you must have met the challenge of the enemy within. I wish to make very clear, then, that it is important to know and to recognize the vibration of hate and hate creation of the manifestation of God in any form, whether it is a figure of authority, whether it is a child, whether it is man, woman. People have problems with certain garments of God. Therefore, we come in all those different relationships. 
Some people get along fine with men, but they hate women because they hated their mother. And so they always have a problem with women, or they always have a problem with men, or they don't get along with children, or they can't bear an authority figure, or they don't like themselves. You have to get this down to the specifics. Does this come under the Father? Does it come under the Son? Does it come under the Holy Spirit? Does it come under the Divine Mother? Thus you define the four quadrants. There is one of these lines in each of the four quadrants. If you're going to master God love with Saint Germain, you're going to have, a, have to have a victory in your relationship with the Father because the etheric quadrant is the quadrant of our Father. You're going to have to make your peace with Saint Germain because he is the hierarch of that line of the clock. You're going to have to make your peace with the hierarchs of Aquarius. And you're going to have to face the challenges of the sacred fire in the fire signs. That is the etheric quadrant. And so it goes. If you have a problem with the son, the sons and daughters of God, in other words, brothers and sisters on the path, there you have the problem of the force of Antichrist, the three o'clock line, the mental quadrant. There comes the assailant, the Luciferians, the fallen angels to take from you the mind of God. You have to make your peace with the Son of God and not have the hatred of the Christ child. And when you have that peace and you are certain you have it into the very core of your being, then you, you realize that you must take on and call for the binding and the judgment of the planetary beast of the abuser of the child, the dragon that makes war against the woman who is bringing forth the man-child. So it goes deeper and deeper. Every one of us sitting here today has made a decision as to how far we are willing to go to challenge this core of division that separates us from our mighty I am presence in this moment. If you did not have these elements in the subconscious, you would not be carrying the karma you have and you would not be separate in identity, in manifestation, from your I am presence. So you can believe me that because the I am presence is absolute God good, you cannot be one with that presence until you have demanded the binding and separated out from these conditions of absolute evil in the subconscious of the psyche. They surface now and then but the dweller on the threshold keeps them very well hidden. What I am saying today then is that, as I've said before, the guru is the greatest enemy of this dweller and this absolute evil. The guru is aware of it and must be aware of it in order to, in fact, defend the soul against that condition of consciousness and defend the office of the guru against it. Jesus himself, in the few hours before his passion, challenged and accused the high priests of plotting to kill him. And they resorted that he was mad. He was insane. They hadn't plotted to kill him. It is the denial of absolute evil. He called their shot before the plot even began to unfold. He called that dweller, in some cases before the outer self, even had the awareness that that anger was within. This is the difficulty in the Guru Chila relationship today where because people are judging themselves and their position on the path by their outer modes of behavior, they raise a hue and a cry when you tell them that they have this core hatred or this core anger or that they are ungrateful when they can think of all kinds of things they are grateful for. It is the condition of consciousness and the condition of the psyche. It is on the foundation of this understanding of the path of initiation that Maitreya is prepared to give each and every one of you as keepers of the flame, as students, whether you think you are at the beginning of the path, 
I tell you, you are here because you have been on this path for lifetimes. You have been looking forward to and anticipating the moment when there could be in physical manifestation Maitreya's mystery school. There could be in physical manifestation a place where when going through these trials within the soul itself, you could be protected. You could have the reinforcement of the angels, the archangels, the ascended masters, where you could have a living teaching and a continuous message and a reinforcement of someone and then the few in embodiment who would wear the mantle to defend you when the soul should be naked and shorn of the full garment and protection of her Christ self and yet in that nakedness have to confront the absolute evil of the fallen angels and of the dweller within itself. It is a matter and a question of cosmic surgery and that is the opportunity that the light bearers are being given on the planet today. The opportunity is immense because Sanat Kumara and the hierarchies of heaven have opened the gates and said, under the sponsorship of Saint Germain in this era, following this path and taking it, you can make your ascension in this life. I have seen any number of individuals, keepers of the flame, who have come through this activity who have passed on, who have entered into the etheric temples. And after the change called death in those etheric temples, they have had to grapple with and deal with the very teaching I'm giving to you and the very initiations that must be built upon this teaching because our eyes are wide open as to what is the challenge, what will we meet, how fierce it will be, and how it does demand us to summon all of our forces for the binding of those conditions. And after a number of years in the etheric retreats, I would be contacted by Lanello and told that it is the time for the ascension of such and such and one. And I would make the calls and that individual would then be taken into the atomic accelerator, which is a chair, which is in the Grand Teton at the Royal Teton retreat. And also it has been seen in the Cave of Symbols. And there the person sits in that chair and receive the currents of the ascension flame for the stepping up of their atoms so that they may enter into the ritual of the ascension. It is a great gift and dispensation for our time that there should exist in the etheric octave that ascension chair where individuals may still be assisted who have not garnered sufficient sacred fire in their temples to be ready to enter into that flame. There are people here today who can make their ascension in the exact moment of their passing from the screen of life, as we witnessed our beloved Mark do. And there are others who, because of the neglect of this that I am teaching you today, may spend any number of years in the etheric octave until you have separated yourselves out from the conditions of the dweller on the threshold. The knowledge that we may do this after the change called death should not allow us to indulge in procrastination. We have a very vested reason in accomplishing this as swiftly as possible. The one right before our very noses is the reason of our own beloved El Moria, who has been benched for the want of chilaship of those he has sponsored for so long, as well as for the condition of the world in this hour. But even more important, then the saving of our own guru is the saving of our chila ship so that we may defend not only El Moria, but the planet and the light bearers who will undergo these initiations as we undergo them, but will have no teaching, no system of mantra or prayer, no particular moorings to help them to pass their tests. And this is of greatest concern to Alpha and Omega, to Lord Gautama, which is why all our emphasis is intended to be on the cutting free and the protection of the light bearers of the world. They enter the most serious of all the three plumes. Not the power, not the wisdom, but the divine love is the greatest challenge because it is the greatest of these three, charity. Charity is the one that is the key. If we then pass our initiations and get the victory over the beast, we will discover that we can hold up and account for 
One, three, five, ten light bearers, perhaps one of them our twin flame somewhere on the planet who will go through this. And when you have those burdens and heaviness some days on your path and you know not why, it is often because you are holding the balance for another light bearer who must pass through initiations without the benefit of the call that you know. When I have those very heavy days, I am very careful to make the call for the binding of the forces assailing the light bearers before I make the call of the reverse the tide or any other call to have this burden removed from me because I know that someone must bear it and if I do not, then what will occur in the life of another who cannot so easily bear it and doesn't have the mantle and the sponsorship. That doesn't mean to say that you should have the path of martyrdom and feel that you always should be carrying a weight, but it does mean that you should have the fire in your temple so that you can call to the Elohim of God and get that energy transmuted and bound and removed from the planet so that it will not burden another. That is the path we have chosen to walk. I would ask you then, with all of my heart, to make the call to Cyclopeia and the all-seeing eye of God, that you will have the willingness and the courage to see and know what is unreal, and finally the courage to enter the path of sacrificing that unreality, of entering to a path of surrender, selflessness, and service. This is the path of the Ruby Ray Cross. I ask you not to deceive yourselves, not to hide from yourselves, not to ignore and tend to cover over or brush under the rug those things that need attention in your life. Things such as pacifism, untidiness, sloppiness, inattention to detail, and a host of other things you can name. This surface pacifism and surface not being engaged in a path of chileship in one's Christhood are very clear signs of a core anger against God, an anger that is so great that says, I will not work your works upon earth. I will just kind of be a bump on a log and move when somebody gives me a poke. It's a kind of an attitude where people are unwilling, but they don't really do too much that's too wrong. They manage to be a tool for all kinds of ignorant animal magnetism. And you know very well, when you're standing where I stand, that that density and that clumsiness and that just non-efficiency of individuals is belying a malice and a hatred of God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and Divine Mother, the hatred for the personage of God in the ancient gurus unto the present that says, you have done this to me. I am angry with you, God. I will never forgive you, God. And therefore, I will not be engaged in your service on earth. But I'll just hang around and be a nuisance in between all the rest of the people who are so engaged. The love of the work of God and the love of the word of God shows in increasing intensity the increasing personality of good that you have embodied. So you will not see the anger itself necessarily, but you will see that you can become a block, a stumbling block to the in entire plan of the Great White Brotherhood on the planet, or you may become a very poor example by un being unfaithful to your wife, unfaithful to your husband, unfaithful to your children, unfaithful to your employer. And you may say, well, I made a mistake, and whoever it is may forgive you, but you must ask, why did I make that mistake? It's because of the core anger against God. Getting even with God, that is what the dweller on the threshold is about. These statements I'm making to you are for the quickening of your soul, that you might become the wise ones, the illumined ones, and become so quickly and that you might realize that the dweller or the ego or the outer self may have you convinced that everything is all right with you. 
but I want you to be unconvinced of that. And I want to tell you that there's a part of the consciousness of self that feels that it is getting away with hiding from God because it says, see God, I'm going through all of the motions of doing all these things and therefore you have to reward me. So there's a part of the self that has convinced itself and the rest of oneself that it's getting away with a superficial path. And you'll find that to a much greater degree in your mainline churches where 15 minutes a week or a half hour a week is a sufficient mode of, of worship and the worship discontinues and the same old human activity continues in between. I say this by way of telling you that God's answer to this dilemma, this very dilemma which every one of us must face, is the path of the Bodhisattva. We are giving Kuan Yin's mantras for the path of the Bodhisattva. These vows, therefore, bind us to God, bind us to our commitment to him, bind us by that commitment to his law, to the fulfilling of what we say. The keeping of those vows must necessarily be surrounded by a religious life, a path of spirituality, of entering the sacred fire whereby daily we defeat all opposition to the vows we have taken and to the promises we have made. By the vow, even if we do not have the attainment, we bind ourselves to the living cosmic Christ. We bind ourselves to the heart of Kuan Yin, to the heart of Maitreya, to the heart of the Guru. And therefore we receive the tremendous strengthening and the reinforcement of ourselves. We receive the electronic presence of that Guru for those moments and hours when we must slay the very dweller on that particular line and degree of the clock, 360 degrees of the cosmic clock. And in those moments it is our vow, our tie that binds us by love to that one we cherish and to all the great ones whom we cherish. That is why without the path of the Bodhisattva, we don't make it beyond a nice level of a path of worship and being good human beings and getting along well with everyone. We don't get beyond that level and we can use the Ascended Master's teachings to stay at that level. And that's all right. That's the outer court. It's all right so long as you realize that it's a very delicate equilibrium to remain as a good human person and yet to realize that hot upon one's heels are the fallen angels recognizing that if we get just a little bit too good, we're going to become that Christed one and therefore we will be a threat to them. So even if you are at that level of saying, well, I'll take my equilibrium uh, with my, my uh, so many necessary decrees, if you are a soul of light in any case, they've had your number for two million years and more. So it's not like you're going to hide out at that level of mediocrity on the path, but it does work for a while. But you're never quite safe because the day of the vengeance of our God comes. God's vengeance, he has promised. He has said, I will repay. It's not a vengeance such as our current sense of that term. It is the day when karma descends by the great law. It's the day when we are compelled to meet that karma and sometimes it comes in great calamity. The sudden loss of loved ones, sudden terminal diseases, sudden accidents, sudden impairments, and all of a sudden it takes more than just being that certain level of chila of being a good person to deal with that situation, that avalanche. So wise keepers of the flame bank the fires in their hearts and in their chakras against the day when they must confront their human creation and their dweller. Knowing then that whether you see it or not or recognize it or are preparing for it, that this day is coming upon you personally because it's coming upon the whole planet and because we have had the teachings long enough to know and to know better, we have taken up the teachings of Gautama Buddha and Lord Maitreya 
on the path of the Bodhisattva, the path of fearless compassion, and the understanding that the beginning of that path, as taught by Gautama Buddha, is the way of confession, of desiring to disassociate oneself from the former self by acknowledging these deeds, putting them into the fire, and calling to the intercessor that we see, which in this case happens to be myself, to appeal to God for the consuming of those conditions and those records, and to appeal for mercy, for forgiveness, and to assign a penance in a disciplined environment. The 33 manifestations of Avalokiteshvara as Kuan Yin do represent the 33 steps of initiation that you will pass through before you have your complete victory over the not-self. And these 33 steps are literally marked on the spinal altar from the base of the spine chakra to the crown. When we use these 33 mantras then, we are calling for that particular quality and manifestation of Kuan Yin to be with us, to reinforce us, the recitation of the mantra makes all of ourselves and our cells and atoms and chakras to be endued with her electronic presence in that mode. We never know what the day and the hour of the coming of the initiator will be, and therefore for the coming of the dweller on the threshold who opposes that initiation. If we put on the electronic presence of Kuan Yin by using her mantras constantly, as so many of the Eastern devotees do in their temples, they are continually reciting their mantras. They are under their breath. They are very devout and dedicated to them, these bhikkhus, these monks, these religious, for they know what they are about. They know they are putting on the great dharmakaya, the great I am presence body of the guru for the day and the hour when the absolute evil of the untransmuted self does come upon them. Kuan Yin's path, which is also the path of Mother Mary. Mother Mary is an archaei, bodhisattva. Beloved Kuan Yin is the bodhisattva that has come to the path of the Eastern tradition. They together stand as the pillars of the Divine Mother upon our altar and in the temple of your being. You have recourse to them as they represent the Alpha and the Omega in the mother body. Through their hearts we enter the path of discipleship unto Jesus Christ, of bodhisattvahood unto the true Buddha and the living one. By this very teaching and path then, it is not so much that you wrestle and challenge that dweller and that absolute evil, but the very power of Mother Mary, whom we reach in the Hail Mary, and of Kuan Yin and her mantras is a process whereby we are assimilating God, absolute good. And the pressure of that absolute good is also, by our mantra, a power of transmutation in the dweller, in the not-self, in the absolute evil beneath, so that it is continually being transmuted through our conscious affirmation of the path and our conscious giving of those mantras. The preceding lecture was given by Elizabeth Clare Prophet, world-renowned author and spiritual teacher. This is a presentation of the Summit Lighthouse, an international spiritual organization dedicated to universal enlightenment. Founded in 1958, the Summit Lighthouse is a beacon of truth to thousands worldwide and a leader in New Thought Spirituality. This program is brought to you by The Summit Lighthouse. For more information, call 1-800-245-5445 or visit our website at www.summitlighthouse.org. Outside the USA, call 406-848-9500 or write to The Summit Lighthouse, 63 Summit Way, Gardner, Montana, 59030, USA.